Welcome to this August edition of Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan. Today we're going to begin a multi-part look at uh, Trigger Warning by Neil Gaiman. <clears throat> so Neil Gaiman is a rather uh, legendary name in the realms of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. His work has spanned uh, the, or has run the gamut from novels to short stories to graphic novels to movies uh, to pretty much any other medium you can think of and uh, children's books even. And so uh, with that in mind, he's a natural, uh, natural topic of discussion for a show like this. Uh, I actually had the privilege of meeting Neil Gaiman a number of years ago, um, and uh, he signed one of my books, and uh, was a very, just a very cool, very friendly, uh, down-to-earth uh, kind of guy. Uh, Stefan, you were the one who had suggested this particular book, so what was in your mind uh, picking this one? Well, first, uh, I definitely wanted to do something by Gaiman, and when I saw the title, I was like, okay, this has got to be ripe for something, because he's usually on the pulse of something happening in, on Twitter. He's always uh, saying his opinion. He's a very, very friendly, down-to-earth nice guy, as you mentioned, and uh, I was like, okay, where is he going to go with this? And then we actually picked up the book, and we read the, the intro, we're like, hmm, okay, he just wanted to use the title. There's absolutely nothing to do with the uh, the current... Uh, terminology mm -hmm. of trigger warning. So I was, it was a bit of a <laughs> letdown, <laughs> but uh, he, he knows how to get people's attention. So um, yeah. I, I thought it was worthwhile. And you know what? It's still a, a great uh, anthology of his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, and it, I, I think, I do think he used the term trigger warning in, in a, uh, his intent with using it though was very subversive, I thought, because rather than tap into the current, uh, discussions on campus safe spaces and trigger warnings and all of this nonsense uh what he does is he actually turns it on its head and it's like he talks about how you know there's actually a sense of excitement and anticipation when someone says that you know we're about to go into the go over to the dark side and that kind of thing so he does use it in a a, a very practical way but it's not in a politicized context uh which is uh which is nice um and i i was worried about that too um but yeah, this this is a collection of a rather wide range of stories, and it, it's a very nice collection. Uh, there are certain stories that will just knock you over. There are certain ones that are a little bit milk toast, uh, and we'll get into what we think is what as we go. So the first piece in this is actually called "Making a Chair," and it's I guess sort of a poem, uh, and. It's just kind of a nice little verse on making uh, making a chair, the intention of sitting down to write and that sort of thing. Part of me thought this was a neat way to start a book of short stories. Another part of me kind of found it a little pretentious. What did you think, Stefan? Oh, yeah, there's lots of little stories throughout uh, this, this anthology that are not stories. They're actual poems. And for that, you can be as pretentious as you like. In, so yeah. in stories like this, where he's literally saying, I am making a chair, and then I'm thinking about being a writer, and there's a warning label on the chair, and maybe when I stop uh, you know, writing uh, books, I'm going to climb that chair, uh, you know, then, okay, fine. I, I get where you're going with that. Uh, it doesn't have to be said, though. You don't have to actually write that out in two pages and tell us. That, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it is very quaint, and mm -hmm. I think uh, all of these, these little stories... These uh, these very pretentious little stories build up to the next really like wow like he was he was getting like his juices going for uh, yeah. for the next uh, really good story he's coming up with so I sort yeah. of forgive him for that but at the same time I, I bet he had like twelve others <laughs> he had <laughs> that were just yeah. on the back of his head going yeah I gotta write about this and then he thinks oh this is crap yeah. let's throw that away or yeah. or he literally just was sitting down in a bar somewhere and. Uh, scribbled it on a napkin and thought, hey, I can make that into a little cute little uh, memento of something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of like Patton Oswalt said with, you know, talked about, Patton Oswalt talked about reading the complete writings of Edgar Allan Poe, who's obviously a, a literary great uh, in the, the canon of, of the written word, but he said part of what made Poe great was that he just wrote and wrote and wrote constantly, and if you write everything and don't stop writing, you will eventually hit on something like the pit and the pendulum or the telltale heart or, you know, all of this stuff, follow the house of Usher. 
Uh, but uh, he said a lot of Poe's writing, it just felt like, you know, quote the Raven nevermore. Okay, and now here's a story about my pants. You know, and it's that, that kind of thing of just let me write about, write and write and write and get all this out. And I think there's, there's a certain amount of that. The Making the Chair was kind of like, that was a nice little poem. Uh, but I think the first real story in the book is uh, Lunar Labyrinth. And he says that he wrote this as a tribute to Gene Wolfe, but um, honestly, it really reads more like a tribute to H.P. Lovecraft, who we know that um, Gaiman was hugely influenced by. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's a... Uh, I found it to be a nice, creepy little story, and it's very worthy of... You know, there's what the uh, New York Times book review um, on the cover of this book talks about how... Um, when you, when this, the the reviewer says when they read Gaiman, the world drops away and they're just lost in his his world and everything and and everything else disappears and that was really the case with this. He does such a good job of just lulling you into his reality and into the weirdness of this place and the the idea of this labyrinth that you can only see by the light of the moon and uh, that sort of thing. And so. I really enjoyed that one. What did you think? Well, I thought he was still on his his pretentious sort of stint of uh, playing with alliteration a little bit too much. And the narrator, as he has become, and he's describing the words, like the last sentence, the first few par uh, conversations or, or sentences with the, the, the fellow who he's trying to have a conversation with because he's taking him somewhere. And he's, you know, it's kind of like two strangers. It's like, okay, well, we're going somewhere. We may as well fill up some time and talk about stuff. And he feels like he has to add the con add to the conversation. And you're sort of telling stories. And you're like, okay, where are you going with this game? And, and we we get that there's a creepy, mysterious, you have to fill in the blanks sort of vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, this is a guy. He's exploring the countryside. He l He's attracted to weird stuff like this. And then there's this sort of mythological... Uh, spiritual aspect which just sort of pops in there and you're like where did that come from is, is this guy uh, does he worship something does he believe in something it's sort of you're not sure so it's mm -hmm. sort of it's it's a little too vague mm -hmm. and that's what sort of puts me off but I get where he was trying to go with it so yeah if the person is really into this style and and reads this and for what's little is there and you you can visualize everything it's great Mm -hmm. uh, for someone like me who's a bit more down to earth, I'm looking at this. I'm going, okay, what what is going on here? Uh, mm -hmm. Why is the moon suddenly larger? Uh, what is this guy talking about when he's referring to a cordon bleu dessert? I mean, what? I, my brain is like asking all these questions. So mm -hmm. I, I lose the I lose the the mystery and I lose the uh, the uh, the world he's trying to to throw us into very slowly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I agree. And uh, to, a, to a certain extent, I, I think I probably got into it a little more, but um, I thought it was a nice way to kind of get the ball rolling. You know, it's more sure. of a tone better than a deeper story. Now, when we talk about deeper stories, the next one, the thing about Cassandra, Ooh. this, yeah, this was the story that to me was, you know, the Grand Slam home run. You know what I mean? It was, uh, he, uh, it's because the reason it works, this is a story about a man who um, is out with his buddies on a bachelor party one night. And one of his buddies says, you know, hey, man, I was on Facebook, social media, and I got in touch with that girl you told us about, Cassandra, that girl that you lost your virginity to in high school. And uh, the guy's like, oh, really? How's she doing? Okay, great. Good to hear that she's doing okay. And the problem is Cassandra was somebody he made up. And he looks into it and finds out that this Cassandra woman is exactly the, the this person that the guy found is exactly the woman that he made up right down to the detail and the life story and everything. And that that's the premise. I'm not going to go any further into what happens, because this is one of those things like uh, Mark Twain, Mysterious Stranger, you know, or, or when Edgar Allan Poe tells you all we see or seem is just a dream within a dream. Uh intimations like that where you question the very nature of reality and of existence and it was it was dreamlike without seeming too abstract it was surreal it was um just it it, it kept me guessing uh, it was it was startling had some great twists along the way 
but this one knocked you know knocked me on the floor yeah this was pretty much i was thinking of ellison the entire time i'm thinking of you know if ellison and and gaiman were in the same class for creative writing and the teacher asks you i want you to write a a two-part fantasy story go crazy and you know ellison would come back with like sex and blood and guts and you know all this crazy stuff and be like wow and then gaiman would be like okay i'm gonna be a nice little polite little story about a guy and a girl yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. but it would be they would both be amazing stories yeah and uh i think that the closest uh comparison i could be would be uh in death bird would be the, the place with no name it's a two-parter yeah. there's there's something at the start and then the world changes in the second part um yeah it just it just really because you get involved with the character so often like what's going on why is he describing this this woman and you know he has his whole life he has all this his backstory he's got his his childhood and it's just it just connects and you're like whoa once mm-hmm. once that uh once that can once that you see that it just it really hits you and you go wow what is yeah. going on here Th- like every one of these stories as as uh obscure as even the poems are is like a taste like a gaiman could keep going he could just yeah. keep going and you wish he would, <laughs> but he, that's the kind of guy he he could just sit back and he knows what to do, and then yeah. he'll, he'll finish his beer and he'll get up and go to a, a conference or something. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's like it, it feels like you know you're right. Any of these ideas he could work out at length and have like a Stephen King length novel, but it would be you know what part of what makes it so effective is you just get that glimpse and the right and you just sit there with your mind blown, you yeah. know. And, and you're right. I mean, Ellison, this 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 is very you can tell that he's very much a close personal friend of, of Harlan Ellison's and very influenced by his writing. Um, so the next story, I'll let you set this one up, Stefan, down to a sunless sea. This is uh, I'm actually not too sure what's going on in this one. You always ask me these questions about these stories. I'm like, Ugh, what is going on with these books? Uh, it's so vague uh, mm-hmm. to the point of being non-offensive. And it makes me go, what was that all about? It's kind of like you have uh, a well-known craft beer in your local town. Everyone mm-hmm. loves it, but it's so vi- it's so generic and, and everyone can consume it that there's really nothing that stands out that you say, oh yeah, mm-hmm. this is this kind of beer, this kind of flavor, even though they have all these brands. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Um, mm-hmm. it. It doesn't really... Like, there was no dramatic element to it. The the protagonist didn't really... It was just, like, a, a short little thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, there's really... Like, this is probably the weakest out of all the ones we're looking at right now mm-hmm. that I mm-hmm. can uh, identify with it, with anything relevant. It's just sort of... Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a similar attempt at what had just come before it, which was this thing of, you know, setting you up one way, making you question the nature of reality more and more. It was... Uh, it was sort of that, and I th- and I thought the the prose of it was nice. It was a nice read, the way it, kind of this lyrical tone that it had, but it doesn't really. It's not as impactful. It's a it, it's it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. Especially part of that's because it immediately follows the previous story that held the same structural concept very well. Um, part because of that you when you get to the story you're just kind of like oh yeah that's nice too you know? yeah it, like i'm trying to go with gaiman because we know gaiman as the guy who loves mythology and he'll say okay this is like the modern world from the past or take a mm-hmm. take a, a a god or something and bring them into the modern world so you're thinking is this an allegory is there uh some some force of nature here and yeah. I, I, is it, are we talking to a personification? I don't know. So, it, and there's there's enough details for them to think it's something sophisticated, but then it just it ends after two pages, and you're just like, I don't know what that was supposed to be. The next story is called "The Truth Is a Cave in the Black Mountains," and this one I could this, I could see where this would be polarizing, but this one really did it for me. I really had a blast with this story. Um, just because it combines so many elements. There's this kind of, uh, you know, we're in this this kind of Celtic region where there's all of that folksy mythology going on. There's a Tolkien-esque element to it. There's a Lovecraftian element to it. There's almost a Chuck Palahniuk element to it. Uh, and so that was really, really fun. Um, I got a blast out of it. And I think it's, I think it's one of the more engaging ones because it's one where he kind of just... Um, kind of just unhooks the brakes on the fantasy element we th- this is 
like I said, this is very much a, a you know, it's got that that Hobbit vibe to it, yeah. and I like that. I, I don't I don't like Tolkien very much per se, but just seeing that executed so well, you know, it's kind of like seeing, um, it's kind of like you know, you go hear a jazz standard you've heard a million times, and a good soloist can you know breathe new life into it. That's what this was for me. Yeah, this is when uh, whenever he writes a, a larger, shorter uh, story, he tends to go out go out a bit more at it, and uh, because it's fantasy, it's like this is like nothing to him. He can do this in his sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's great that he uh, he combined all these these I wouldn't say genres, but all these elements that uh, a typical writer would just say, okay, well we'll have a revenge story, we'll have a, a love story, we'll have this or that. And it's like no, 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 we're gonna we're gonna put this in there, and then we're gonna put this little element there, and, we're gonna, and it just neatly goes on and on, and uh, it, it's almost like a fairy tale in that sense, because not because of its fantasy, but because of uh, you don't know what's gonna happen, you don't know why these this character is doing what he's doing. You think it's for this, and everyone thinks it's for that, and uh, you know, there's maybe a few things I was a little questioning of, but other than that, it was just very well put together. Uh, it wasn't too long. I wished it was a little bit longer, uh, but it's actually one of those stories where it actually is self-contained. You don't have to keep pushing it further, and it uh, it was m mystical enough for you to say, "Yep, this is a this is a magical world," but it's still grounded in some sort of reality. And and the whole magic element, the whole uh, whimsical, supernatural stuff, was just for the sake of it. It was it didn't, it didn't have to be part of this big engrossing physical metaphysical life that you know these people are involved in no it's just it's just part of the universe and that's it we don't care it doesn't have to be anything spectacular yeah yeah i, th I think so i think it was um it was a great exercise in fantasy uh fantasy fiction and and like i said it, it is it fits that metaphor well of like we're breathing new life into something we're a little familiar with and the twists and turns help he's a, he's very a very twist oriented writer um the next story is uh, my last landlady. It's very brief, um, and it, it's it's sort of a, a spiritual horror kind of story. I, I enjoyed it. What did you think? This is actually a little better than the previous story, uh, down to the sun, down to a sunless sea, because it both inv involves the the concept of of the water. Um, there's a woman involved. Um, it's, I think this is what he might have wanted the, the previous story to be about. Uh, yeah. This was a much clearer, is a little more poetic, actually. Um, uh, there was some sort of a message about how uh, the tenant of uh, an apartment complex is you know, powerless to their landlords, but the landlords are all likable in certain ways, even though they're not attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that sort of message. Yeah, and it was that, of course, the dark mystery uh, horror uh, concept, which could have been an analogy, it could have been an allegory, it could have been a simile. I don't know. It could have been a few other things. So there's always that great sense of mystery when you have these uh, these short, brief, uh, almost poetic stories that uh, are dark and uh, sort of play on the mysticism. Yeah, I think it's one of those. There are certain stories. We were talking about this before, where there are certain stories where you wish he would expand upon it at length. This is more of a story where it's just a quick in out he just smacks you in the face and gets um you know kind of kind of catches you and uh and and puts sends you on your way and, but it's nice to be in this kind of haunting moment you know what i mean and it's the what i keep thinking of a similar comparison there's a song uh by lisa germano called a psychopath and i think it's a very it's a great comparison stylistically because that song uh is just it's it's kind of just touching on these little points that you get the the picture that's painted is that this woman is isolated in a room of her house hiding from this man that's apparently broken in or something or intends to do her harm and you hear this very gentle vague piano and there's you know the sound they, they there's this loop of a uh, police radio in the distance and you know the refrain she just keeps singing a baseball bat a baseball bat and it's like well is that what he's got or is that what she's got and she's going to try to hit him and that get and it's just this haunting little moment and it leaves you there with no resolution that's what this story was it's just such a great haunting little moment and i love stories like that that uh that just uh they they don't they they it's almost like they end up in hell in a way but they leave you know they just leave you there in the most satisfyingly haunting way you know 
I love, um, I love, I love it when I can read a story like this and, you know, put down the, um, you know, put down the book and just feel uncomfortable in my own home, my own comfortable surroundings, you know. It's it's amazing for a writer to write something so short, and Gaiman has been doing this throughout the entire book. He writes a two-page story, he'll write a four-page poem, he'll do this or that, and you're like, wow, how did he get to that point, and how did he get the right amount of words to get the right effect he wanted, even if I didn't understand it? But it, it, he's like, I know very few people, even when I was writing, uh, in school to, to be able to achieve that level of brevity, uh, and, and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it is, it's a great one, two punch of a story. So the next story adventure story, um, unfortunately I have to, as, as I'm looking at it, I was looking at it in the list of stories and trying to re remember, you know, recollect what it was about. And as I looked at it, uh, I realized I uh, just now that I have not read this story. So, uh, <laughs> I, can, I can get this for you. It's okay. This is kind yeah. of like uh, uh, an intro to a movie of yeah. like someone who's about to jump into uh, Doyle's Lost World or an Indiana Jones uh, Last Crusade sort of scenario. And he's talking about his dad. And he's like, what did like he's asking his mom about his dad and his dad's like oh yeah he used to to fly with per uh, pterodactyls and he's like what, what are you talking about mom and uh it, it's sort of that vibe so this is the, one of those stories that gaiman was like he was pitching for an idea and if he just wrote more this yeah. would have been uh one of those uh those next sort of uh yeah. random blockbuster movies that would have action and adventure and and yeah. you know, Germans and what have you. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean that. Way, yeah, you're right. That would have been great. Uh, I can't. I can't speak to it just because I, I unfortunately skipped over it. Um, but uh, the next, um, the next story. I tell you what, we'll do. Uh, let's do uh, one more after this as well. So uh, to make up for my lack of uh, contribution on that one. But the next two stories. In my mind, I hate to say this, and I hate to leave it on this tone, and rest assured when we come back with parts two and three, there will be a lot of other great stuff. Um, this, uh, These two stories, Orange and A Calendar of Tales, were far and away for me the worst stories in the collection. They come right one right after the other. Um, Orange is a story, we'll do them one at a time, but Orange is a story where it's told in the form of a series of answers to questions. And the thing is, you're only given the answers. You're not given the questions themselves. So uh, the first the first uh, question is, it's just somebody's name, so we assume that's their name, the name of the person doing the story, or doing the narrating, the answering. Then the second question is a date, so we assume that's the day they were born. Then the next question is, the last five years before that, we lived in Glasgow, Scotland. Before that, Cardiff, Wales. Okay, so we kind of know what's being said there. Then the next question is, I don't know. I think he's in magazine publishing now. He doesn't talk to us anymore. The divorce is pretty bad, and Mom wound up paying him a lot of money, which seems sort of wrong to me, but maybe it was just worth it to get shot of him. So, um, that, so we understand, okay, that's her father. Uh, then the next... Uh, you know, it, it, but the thing is, it keeps going and it keeps getting more and more vague to the point that I literally have no idea what in the hell happened. <laughs> this was actually one of my favorite stories in the book because it was so strange and you have to put it together. And because it's in the form of a question or a questionnaire that you're filling out at a police station or something like that. So you have to guess what the question is. And you sort of can, it, the questions aren't hard because, you know, you, you, you think there's some weird scientific uh experiment that happened and there's a family involved and they have a mother who's like a, a creator of like some sort of baking franchise or something and uh, she invents something and one of the the prissy daughters ends up putting it on her face or who knows what and it's this whole weird <laughs> science fiction alien thing going on and yeah. uh that's that's as 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 detailed as it gets from the perspective of one of the younger daughters who's trying to figure out what happened to her older daughter or older sister and because it's broken down that way and because you have to imagine writing it that way you're like what the hell was going through his mind how yeah. did he come up with this idea and how how did he know that you know he got to like question 50 and he knew this was going to this was going to work mm -hmm. i i imagine it didn't work for a lot of people because it was so yeah. different 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought because it had to do with, I believe it had to do with aliens mm -hmm. and science fiction or it's like an Outer Limits episode. And because it was told in a certain way, I, I imagine this as uh, one of those weird outer, outer Limits episodes, but it's it's like one of those cheap versions so that there's no there's no budget for all these other things. So there's just a two people in a room talking about this crazy scene of uh, uh, aliens coming down and, and the government getting involved, but it's all a series of quick flashbacks based on the answers to questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I re actually really enjoyed it because of that, because it was so different. I think one thing, uh, a similar format idea where it worked for me, there's a, a computer game on Steam called Her Story, H-E-R, Story, Her Story, and um, it's basically a series of, it's not really even a game, it's just a series of video clips that you watch and assemble in whatever order makes most sense, and they're just videos of a woman being interrogated by the police, and you start uh, learning more about her uh, and about what's going on as you just uncover these clips and you do the research into what she's talking about and everything. Same kind of thing. And so I'm not, I, I certainly am not opposed to the concept. Um, I, I would have to go back and look at it again with a much finer tooth comb because it was very obscure, but it is a neat idea. I'll give it that. This next one, uh, the next one, A Calendar of Tales. This is, this is interesting to me because uh, Harlan Ellison actually did do something similar um, called uh, A to Z in the Chocolate Alphabet, where he did, you know, it's like every story is A is for this, B is for that, and so on and so forth, and it's 25 little uh, mini-stories like that. And um, that, was really, that's, that was really cool. I think this is what Gaiman was trying to do, where he did a different mini-story for each month of the year. And the only one, pardon me, the only one that stands out for me, the only one that I retained, the only one that really blew me away was there was one where, and I'll tell the whole thing because it, to, to give the reader uh, a, an idea of what's going on or why I like this one, but uh, it was a story of a woman who finds a, uh, a genie in a lamp, uh, right. you know, the typical rub the genie, give grant three wishes, and he says, what are your wishes? You know, tell me what your wishes are. And she says, um, uh, I don't know. I don't really have anything. Uh, and they, and, and he says, well, okay, well, I'm going to hang out until you're ready to wish. And they get into this relationship and they fall in love with each other. And, uh, the, uh, and, and they forget about the wishes altogether. And, uh, one then one night they're cuddled up in bed and she says to the genie she says what are your three wishes and he says I don't have any and that's and I just love that I was like man that's cool man that's good it, it just puts a smile on my face I love that uh, that was the only one in the whole 12 story <laughs> sequence that stood out to me what did you think well that that actually did stand out the most because it, I was like waiting for that uh, that little sort of twist that uh, Gaiman is going to do with the genie or with a wish that someone makes and some yeah. sort of tragedy befalls them but it's like nope this is a love story <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, I think the one before it actually I, I really liked with the the ring that keeps <laughs> finding its way back to its owner I thought that could have been a oh yeah that could cool. yeah that could have been a fantastic little uh series of stories like that's the the way you read this particular short story is is like it's like a, an anthology in an anthology so you're like okay yeah. what is the what do the, the the months have to do with each other are these like corresponding to uh gods of the certain uh months it's like nope this is totally game and doing whatever he wants yeah. so when you read this and you're you pick it up and you put it down you really lose track of what the hell is going on because every story is so quick, like really, really quick. Uh, so yeah, you're not going to retain them very well. You're not going to remember very well unless there's something cute about them or something punchy about them. So yeah. that's, that's the problem with the, these kinds of... Uh, I wouldn't call this an anthology. It's an anthology, it's more like a he, he's trying to be creative or too creative or too clever by mm -hmm. doing something like that. So yeah, yeah, once in a while, he'll hit that one out of the park and the other while you're like, uh, you can't do this with everything. So, yeah, like there was, there was one story that was about some kind of time travel or something, and that one just didn't really. I mean, they, they, the most of them fell flat. Uh, so unfortunately, that's 
not not a great uh, place to leave the uh, leave the episode on, unfortunately. But that brings us to the end of part one. Uh, part two, we will be uh, getting into the middle third of the stories, and uh, hopefully, I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about those. So until next time, take care.